Okay, uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, IBS Physics Colloquium at Dijon. It is a great pleasure to have with us uh, today Professor Alessandro Siria from Ecole Normale School. Uh, and, <laughs> and I would like to invite our scientific host today, uh, Sergei, to introduce our speaker. Please, Sergei. Yeah, thanks, Steven, and uh, welcome, Alessandro, to our center and to our IBS uh, headquarter campus. It's a great pleasure to uh, chair this uh, colloquium today. Unfortunately, I cannot be on site uh, because I was tested positive uh, and I'm connected from my home. So uh, let me say a few words about uh, Alessandro. Uh, Alessandro, it is Master of Science at uh, the university in uh, Genoa in, uh, in Italy in 2006. Uh, in, and then he moved on to do his uh, PhD at the uh, University of Joseph Fourier at uh, Grenoble in the physics department uh, in France in 2009. And uh, then he uh, also achieved an even higher uh, grade which is the habilitation, uh, uh, which he kind of like the, the German habilitation, I guess, uh, which um, he received in 2015 at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. Um, he uh, worked at various places. Uh, he did um, uh, research stays, he had research stays at uh, uh, the CNRS uh, in. Uh, uh, Villeurbanne in France, and then he uh, had also a research stay for two years at Brown University in the US. And then since 2012, he uh, became a CNRS researcher at the Laboratory of Physique de l'École Normale Supérieure, CNRS and ENS, École Normale Supérieure in Paris, France. And since 2020, he uh, holds the position of an associate professor uh, I guess, if I understand correctly, at the same place, at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. And uh, he has uh, a number of awards uh, and uh, prestigious um, the grants, which he was able to uh, obtain. And uh, he supervised, of course, many students. And he has a number of uh, uh, quite important institutional responsibilities. And... Uh, he has a lot of publications. He's an experimentalist, which is uh, for us always nice because we are a theory center. So we always like to talk to and to listen to um, experimentalists. And uh, today he will talk about nanofluidics, fluid properties at molecular scale and application to water treatment and energy conservation. So Alessandro, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sergei, for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. So, gonna, exactly today, I'm going to try to present our experimental work. I will be try to be as gentle as possible, not to work too much with the experimental details about um, our investigation of fluid transfer of the nanoscale. So, basically, essentially, what we're going to see here is uh, how we can start from the fundamental investigation on uh, basically fluids and how you behave when you arrive to. Um, very particular and exotic scales, and now from this, invest, let's say, from this particular properties and uh, behavior, we can now develop a, a certain number of tools that are exactly at the beginning was more on energy conversion and uh, water treatment, but now is even led to the the sort of the development of a new kind of um, say computer science or sort of way of uh, way, sort of uh, information technology based not on electron but on so this is basically this sort of a new field that is uh, a, to take the name of ion drawing. So we will see how from fluid properties at the nanoscale we can arrive up to development of uh, new devices based on, uh, on ion properties. So uh, just to start, we we'll start with the sort of a historical um, presentation of what we are doing and what we have done in the last more than ten years in the in this field. So it's going to be like a first part, more of history to present what are, why is interesting from a fundamental point of view to look at the fluids in the nanoscale. And then in the second part, we're going to see what we can actually do with this, uh, with this properties. So 
here we are in, uh, in the talking to in the center of theoretical physics. So, okay, good. So when we talk about fluids, first thing first, let's start with some with the very general and extremely robust equation. So when we say when we talk about fluid and the dynamics, we have always said that we have an extremely comfortable configuration and situation. So we have a very powerful tool that is based on that is essentially the navier stokes equation that allows now some almost 200 years to describe the behavior of fluids at basically every scale. So this simple equation and the single equation, not very simple since it has not been solved precisely up, even after 200 years, allowed to considering good approximation and good hypothesis, basically allowed to predict the behavior of fluids at uh, essentially all the scale of uh, interest so far, be starting from planetary scale, going down to human scale and ending up at the level of uh, microns, the level of cell and biological entities. And allow also, based on this navier stokes equation, is allow, now, allow us now, now to develop a certain number of uh, new tools and devices at the micron scale based on uh, fluid properties at, uh, at the small scale. So we have this single equation that is very robust, so it's extremely nice to work with that. However, as robust as it is, and how and many things it allows us to ask, that us to, to do and to and to develop, nature also shows us that there is a real interest to go beyond this equation. So to go a scale where navier stokes is no longer valid. And nature developed itself uh, to in um, with the fluidic device that are at a scale that is smaller than the micro scale, that is intrinsically in the nano scale. With the Navier Stokes doesn't uh, allow doesn't work anymore, and at this scale has allowed to develop devices that we uh, we are not able to reproduce from experimental context. He has developed, for example, filters that are extremely fast and selective, that are energetically more, way more favorable than uh, than what we can do with the artificial materials. But even develop ionic pumps and active channels able to separate and. Uh, um, and basically be selective to ions. So in nature, ionic channels are able to distinguish to differentiate between K, for example, K plus and Ni plus. So potassium and sodium, they are almost the same in terms of size and terms of charge. Still, nature can, uh, can separate it. And finally, uh, now nature is able also to, to create the kind of sensitive channels that are basically the analogy of a transistor in a certain way, the biological analogy analogy of a transistor where uh, ionic and fluid transport is uh, controlled by external parameters. So all these things are result that we cannot do so far if you just look at another stock situation. And then point us the interest to go a scale that are way smaller and uh, in this configuration where uh, we can start to look at this exotic world. And from a, let's say, from a scientific point of view, right now there have been a sort of a large, very Big efforts from different institutions in order to try to reproduce and to create these uh, devices and these functionalities. I just say, may cite two uh, part from our institute in Paris. That is basically the National National Graphene Institute in the uh, UK, where there is a part of the research that is now developed, dedicated to developing new functional nanofluid device, or even the MIT Water Initiative in the in the US. Both things, these two uh, institutes together with our institute or our institute in, in China, the idea is to develop, to investigate new properties for fluids at the nanoscape and uh, um, finally to, to create and to develop new functionalities. But then, okay, so what is from a point of view, let's say from a theoretical point of view more, or let's say from a scientific point of view, the reason why when you go down at the scale below now the micron, there are things that are start to be different or more interesting. So, this is basically what is happening when you go below one micron, when things start to behave differently. So when you look at the fluids confined in the nanometers up to 100 nanometer, you start to realize that, and this is quite common with other fields of science and nanoscience, is that you cannot neglect anymore the role of our surfaces. So every interaction fluid is going to be basically governed by the interaction with the confined surface. But also, the appearance of a very strong electrostatic interaction between the, 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 the elements of the fluids. And finally, because we are in a soft compass matter, 
we have also to, to look and we have to start to look also the role of thermal fluctuation. But still, this is something that happens in a scale that is not at the level of uh, the breakdown of number stores. Even more, even craziest uh, results can be obtained when you cross this limit that is a fundamental limit around one nanometer when you enter in the, in, the, in, the, in the regime and the region where fluids cannot be described anymore by an average and a, and a media, continuous medium. And has to be looked, and now you start to look at the fluid at, uh, at an ensemble of molecules. This is exactly the scale where Navistos is no longer valid. This is the scale where everything is happened to be strange and weird. And also is a scale, the scale where no classical interaction, I say no classical forces start to, to play in it. So this is basically where we want to, to look. So if you want to look here, then the first thing that you have to do is to be able to realize devices. From an experimental point of view, you have to be able to realize devices that can confine fluid at this scale. So how we did it? Of course, the problem is that you can start to think about using standard techniques like top-down, so basically you tolerate your son. But unfortunately, we are not able to use standard technology based like random of sorry, that works fine with semiconductors that are able to create channels and devices that are at this level of confinement. So the route that we decided to, to follow is basically to use a sort of a bottom bottom up uh, approach where you start to create devices by using nanomaterial that are intrinsically at the scale that you have. So basically, you look for objects that are that comes already at the scale of a nanometer that is where you want to look. so this can be nanotubes of different uh, nature carbon of course but also more nitrogen this is allowed to confine fluids from 50 nanometer down to 2 nanometer but you can even go farther and use bidimensional materials uh, assembled with via uh, uh, interaction that allows to confine fluids at the scale that is comparable to the size of a molecule and quoting our the, the collaborator that we have in, in of Manchester is uh, Professor Gaim. The idea is always the same. That is, if you want to start to introduce new experimental system, in this case, extremely uh, confined water devices, then you have the hope to observe new phenomena. So you do, we don't know exactly what is going to happen. We only know that we are in extreme con configuration for water. And what is going to see, what, what we're going to see, this is a, at the least at the beginning of the sort of, sort of way I'm now. So, Basically, today we're going to exactly present this. But this is the first part. Essentially, is the historical part how we started. So, this measuring um, 1D devices, basically the transport of water ion in nanotubes. This is basically just to prove the exceptionalities of uh, fluid transport at the nanoscale. And then later, we're going to see how using another geometry, you can create sort of advanced or observed sort of advanced neural ion tronics and even neuromorphic response for the development of new, uh, new sort of class of uh, uh, computing devices. So the way that we did, unfortunately, this was a movie, but okay, with the PDF it's not working, but also the way that we do integrate carbon nanotube or boron nitrogen nanotube in a fluidic device is basically using a, a, a nano manipulation setup. So what the idea is that we use a scanning electron microscope coupled with an atomic force microscope to manipulate nanotubes. So the idea that we always play with only one nano. We don't want to use microscopic objects with a lot of uh, system because comparing this result with the microscope with the uh, obtain on billions of nanotubes with a theory is not working well. It's not the other part to follow because averaging is gonna be a, a very little mess. So we work only with an individual object. So the way that we develop and we spend a lot of years is to basically being able to manipulate, displace, cut, and insert uh, one, insole, one individual nanotube in different devices. And the way that we do this is basically we create two different devices. Well, one is to insert a nanotube in a microscopic membrane. This will allow us to basically to, to measure the ionic transport because this measurement, this membrane can be inserted between two reservoirs. And then we will we investigate the, with the, by measuring the ionic current, we investigate ionic transport when you uh, apply different forces. But also, this now our technology, or our nano manipulation setup allows to integrate the nano to be another uh, object, like for example, glass capillary. And this can be easily integrated on optical device that will allow us, for example, measure the flow of So, 
basically, this is the kind of experiment that we have performed so far. So either we are interested in, uh, in the ion transport, so this is going to be the, 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 the device we are using, or in water transport. And what we'll, we can observe with this, uh, with this device, we don't, we don't present everything, but I just show you an example, an example of ionic conductance and transport of ions in, uh, in a boron nitrate nanotubes. So this is a very typical ex example that we have. So basically it's the, the, conduct, the transport as a function of the soil concentration. And what we observe in, uh, in, uh, in boron nitrate nanotube is that the, the transport of ions is strongly affected by the presence of the surface. So essentially what you observe here, we, we, Okay, this is sort of a transition between high regime where everything comes from the from the bulk and the source in the bulk. And here basically we, we observe that the, the, the charge carriers are independent on the uh, on the soil concentration. So basically everything comes from the surface. So we can extract, for example, very large surface charge values and very large conduction at, at the surface. But what is the, the main consequence of such uh, of such uh, uh, let's say uh, large uh, surface correction is that, for example, we start using this uh, uh, conduction at the surface. We can use we can basically convert quite easily the um, the, um, the the energy coming from the osmotic mixing. So, I'm not sure how to fix it. I'm sorry. Should be, should be, should be, if you open the PDF, it should be fine. Okay. So, basically, as we can see, is that. Wait a minute. Yeah. But there is this. Okay. Good. Okay. So, one of the consequences that we're saying that of this surface correction is that we are now able, for example, to create uh, an, um, an ionic current when the forcing is not now a voltage or anything, but is uh, a concentration gradient. So this is of particular interest, for example, in the case of energy conversion, and particularly energy conversion of osmotic energy. That uh, just to, to present, so the idea is, okay, what is the osmotic energy and why it is interesting? So the idea is that essentially, Osmotic energy is the energy that comes from the mixing of river water and salt water. So this is the it's just essentially the, the energy of mixing. So we know that mixing is in itself a phenomenon it's spontaneous. You don't need to do anything to mix. So it, this means that there is a sort of a hidden energy inside, and this energy can be can be extracted and converted. So this energy essentially comes from the disorder, is an interest in entropy. So the fact that uh, you change the entropic state between uh, two solutions that are separated and coming to a solution with the with the uniform okay, with the uniform concentration of the round. So we can okay, we can now try to understand what is this maximum energy available. So this basically is just calculating the, the, the difference of free energy between the the state with the two solutions with different concentration and the final solution with the common with the constant uh, with the common uh, concentration. And in the case of ideal solution, okay, it's a bigger approximation. We end up extracting this uh, value of, of uh, energy density that is in the order of one kilowatt hour per cubic meter. So this value is extremely low if you compare to other source of energy. That is true. In the sense that it's twenty times twenty thousand times lower than oil. But however, it's extremely interesting because of the amount of salty water and river water that we have. So if you consider a sort of estimation worldwide, you can extract that, you can understand a sort of a potential of around 20,000 terawatt hour per year, that is equivalent of more than 2,000 nuclear reactor. This is old, so we know since that this energy exists since, this, since the 40s, and we are trying to convert it since the 70s. However, we have never been able to do it efficiently, and the problem was that the technology were very, uh, the membranes that were used until, until now, they were extremely, uh, I say, uh, non-performing. 
That's a good idea. That was a, a, a real prototype that had been built in Norway in the, in the last decade. It was a building, standard building. At the end of the day, it was a power plant able to, to supply power for one coffee machine. So that was uh, the result that we were in so far. Not extremely efficient, let's say. But something changed exactly in, in 2012 when we showed that uh, this limitation or this poor efficiency was not something like fundamental limit, but just a technological limit. And the use of nanomaterial can completely change the thing because the use of novel nanomaterial with, uh, example, for example, an super reactivity, or I will see this for surface, a large surface conduction, can boost this energy conversion. In our case, for example, with the, with the, with the boron atom nanotube, we were able to show a conversion that was three orders of magnitude larger than the So we observe it on, uh, um, on uh, we observe it on, uh, on boron atom nanotube. Other groups show it, also observe it with uh, nanopores made of B-dimensional materials. Now it's also been observed with graphene or other kind of uh, carbon materials. So now there is a hope to develop a new membrane that can really boost this energy conversion. However, when you want to move from a lab to an industry, you need to be able to scale up. Not all, all the nanomaterial can be used. Only if you want to create a, a real membrane, you need to or use material that are very interesting from a, from a fundamental point of view with a large surface soil, but also very easy to scale up in our third lab. So this is basically what we we are doing since uh, 2015 with a company that we have created from the lab. So we are now able to prepare membrane with artificial material. This company now, okay, it's after seven years, is now is now signed a contract with the um, with the French national supply, but well, it's a supply and electric supply company to create to to build the first prototype. In the south of France in two years. So the idea is now in two years we should see if our membranes and our device is able to produce energy uh, with the mixing of, uh, of the two. Of the two and okay, but beyond this part that is purely related to, to let's say, application of energy, or in the world also with our device, we are also able to investigate the sort of a positive result that has been in the last day, last years around interaction between the carbon and water. Where basically for since 2006, experiments like we are so here have been showing exceptional properties of carbon material in terms of water permeation. So all the kind of material that were tested with carbon with based on carbon show permeability like three, four orders of magnitude larger than what was what was expected. And all of this was clearly not understandable to with, with our current state of the art uh, theoretical modeling. But also there was also some lack of a result from a, let's say, pure and clear experimental result in order to develop a novel material. So this is basically what uh, what we did with our device based on the nanopipette. And we investigate, for example, the, the permeability of carbon nanotubes and boron nitrogen nanotubes changing, for example, the, the, um, the ranges. So what we observe is that in the case of a carbon nanotube, indeed, the permeability is extremely large compared to the theory, compared to, to based on other stocks, with the, an enhancement factor that was ex, very large and depending on the surface, uh, on the on the radius. And then we compare this with the uh, um, uh, boron nitrogen nanotube that are basically the same material, just with electronic properties that are different. And we observe here in, that uh, in the case of boron nitrogen nanotube, the the, the, the the permeability was basically as expected by another specification. So new material very similar presented a very different results. And this was not possible to understand with standard uh, classical hydrodynamics, even when you have considered this case. So there was something that was complicated. So the uh, Alessandro, can I oh, sorry yeah. to, to interrupt? Can you go one slide back, please? Can you just sure. remind me what, what is the main difference between these two materials, CNT and DNNT? From a structural point of view, they are exactly the same. There is a few percent of difference between the two structures. Carbon nanotubes are essentially semi-metallic. They can be semiconductor or metallic, but they are, let's say, um, they are semi-metallic in a certain way. And while boron nitrate is a perfect a large gap insulator with 5.5 electron volt of gap. So one is the, the only difference is one is conducting and the other is not. 
Thank you. So from a point of view of, uh, exactly, if you look at this from a point of view of uh, interaction with, this, with the surface, you would not consider, you would not expect any difference. And molecular dynamic simulation did show no difference. However, when you that, then you calculate the friction force between the water and the surface, you realize that in our case, yes, the, the carbon nanotube presents a very low friction force, while boron nitrate presents a very large surface. And still, this, as I was saying, the file completed the theoretical understanding of based on uh, on classical uh, you know, on classical uh, uh, reason. And for that, so that was what we developed in the last year, trying to rationalize the result. And then, for do to do this, we 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 realized that is the, diff, the the clear difference between the two materials, like we said before, is clearly the fact that the one is on the electronic property. So. There is a suggestion that at the end, the electronic properties of the material may play a role. However, it's very complicated to, inter to introduce explicitly the inter electronic interaction to, uh, to calculate the, 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 the water solid friction. So to do that, basically we move from this particle uh, where we consider just molecules and electrons, and we start to look at basically at the, at the, at the friction force between water and, uh, and the solid, but now looking at the behavior of this collective excitation. So they know our idea is that, okay, we know that there are molecules in the water that are, that are basically fluctuating because of thermal energy. The question is, does it, is it possible that this excitation, this collective excitation of fluid in the molecules can interact with the excitation, the collective excitation of the electrons in the, in the solid? Okay, the first thing that we can say is that basically what you say is that, is there a transfer of energy between one collective excitation to the other? But the first thing that we say is that, okay, water is uh, basically the, 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 the collective excitation in water is basically the thermal energy in the order of few million electron volts. While in the case of electrons, we always expect to be in the order of few electron volts. So there is a very big mismatch of energy between the two cells. So this suggests that essentially that there should be very little interaction between water, um, water excitation in the water and excitation in the electrons. However, if you look, what happened in the case of, of carbon material, you realize that this is, this is not always the case. For example, here we just showed that, okay, this is the, okay, the, the, um, the electric response of water that is basically characterized by this divide peak in the hundreds of million electron volt. And here I show you just the, exactly the expansion uh, relation for, uh, for carbon materials, so graphene that is this part, and the uh, graphite that is this dot. So as you see, graphene is basically characterized by this uh, semilinear expression uh, relation with where you will see very little nodes are at the energy of the, of the water. So you expect here a very low interaction. However, if you look at, for example, in what happened with the graphite, you see the graphite is characterized by this sort of dispersionless mode where there are plenty of modes with the uh, different wave, wavelength. And all of these modes are exactly in the range of energy around 100 millivolts that then can couple very well with the, with the, with the water. So just looking at this, and we're looking at basically this inter, uh, expression for the force, you would say that uh, you can expect that the, interaction, that the friction force on water, or from water on graphite should be much larger than uh, on graphene. And then you can say, extend this reasoning even to the case of carbon nanotube, where you know the carbon nanotube have an electronic and uh, uh, the electric response that is strongly dependent on the radius. And here is basically what we compare with the, the, the dot, the, the points here, the experimental results, while the, 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 the lines are the, are the theoretical prediction based on this equation with, the, I don't know if you see, it's not working very well. The, the pointer, but okay, with the basic on this equation, and then okay, we just consider three different modeling, considering of the three different uh, kind of nanotube, and you observe that you see that if you just take into account the evolution of the electronic properties um, of the electric properties of the nanotube, you can fit more or less the the, the, the results. So basically, this proof that the this rule or this result can be understood if you start to look at non-classical source of interaction between the solid and the water. And that's all, always, all we can say, give us now the opportunity to sort of harness this complex interplay between the free transport and the quantum property of the materials in order to develop a new source of interaction. 
So this was basically the story just proving that there is something weird and interesting when you go to the nanoscale. And now we'll see what, what, what happened when you go even farther in the level of confinement, and then how you can now really think about creating sort of advanced uh, ion drawings and uh, neuromorphic response. So to do that, so to go farther in the level of confinement, you can't use nanotube, even now it's not too big, because nanotube can get right up to a few nanometers, two nanometers in the best case. And then to do that, we, we follow the lead of, uh, of uh, Professor Dan in Manchester, where they develop uh, a new class of nanofluidic device, or even nanofluidic device, where they were able to confine uh, water or fluids below the nanometer by basically using stacking of, of graphene with graphene as a space. So as you can see here, the idea is that you use um, a, a bottom graphite and the top graphite, and they separate the two with the individual stripes of graphene. So now the distance between the top and the bottom is controlled by the thickness of the spacer. This spacer can be one atomic layer of carbon, two atomic layers of carbon, and so on. So you can control this distance from 0 0.3 nanometer up to a few tens of nanometer by changing the number of, of layers. And this allows, for example, to yeah, confine fluids at the level of monoclons. With this, we just modify a little bit and we generalize the system because the device, or let's say that this uh, fabrication technique, in a certain way, it, as good as it was and as revolutionary it was, was in a certain way limited by the proper, by, by the characteristic of the surface because you could not use or modify too much the, the, the property of the confining surface because it was seen graphite, graphite and just pure graphite. And then we, we couple this technique with the direct milling of, uh, of the carbon using an electron beam. So basically this allows us to compare, for example, pristine carbon with activated carbon under electron uh, irradiation. So, from a fundamental point of view, this is just I will not present enter too much in the in the details, but just using this technique allows, for example, to, to show even more how at this scale a slight change of the property of the surface modified completely the, the ionic transport. So here we compare um, the pristine the carbon, so basically pure graphite without any, any modification, to the activated carbon, where basically it was carbon with the, uh, under the twin uh, under electron uh, irradiation. So we are still looking at the same surface, it's still carbon, nothing changed. The only difference is that one is completely flat with no, uh, no electronic irradiation, while the other creates a sort of uh, charge side here and there because of this electronic irradiation. And as you can see here, just the two, the two device behaves completely different, where basically in the case of a pristine, very clean, uh, graphite, you have a very low surface conduction and correction, but you have a very large uh, slippage or, or equivalently low friction. While in the case of activated carbon, carbon, you have a very large surface conduction coming from this charged site that you want to use, but at the same time, a very low uh, surface. So it means that you can tune now with the Boltzmann the property of this uh, out of the solid. So you have now just you use you can use the same material, but you can. In use, you can move from one conducting state to a non conducting state by just by changing the properties of the of the state. And with this, what you can do at the end? For example, you can go beyond what, uh, what is the standard idea of, of a fluid transport. Because now that you are a, a, at the Anderson scale, you can really have you know, a new view on the transport as a molecular scale, but also you can start to take to really profit of the. Of what can be obtained in the in the very 2D in the very real 2D um, confinement, where you have basically one molecule that is confined between two slits, and where you can change the properties of this of the surface. And now, for example, you can you you can profit of, for example of very long and peculiar electrostatic interaction that are in 2D at a very low distance. And what can offer this? What can you can create with this? For example, what you can you can create is new source, new form, a new class of uh, ionic transport. Where, for example, here you observe the appearance of uh, con devices with uh, very weird conduct uh, conductance of response. So here you see that the conduction, for example, shows this the appearance of this hysteresis. But it's not in itself the hysteresis is not particularly important. What is important is the, the fact that you have a pinch and essentially 
two uh, two states with you have one state of high conduction and high conductance and one state of low conductance and this state depends on uh, on the history so basically this device that from a theoretical point of view we understood that really comes from the interaction with e to e is essentially a memory system. so an electronic device or a ionic device in this case with the uh, where the the conductors conductances depend on the history of the uh, we you have different kind of uh, device, different kind of resistors. This is basically one more like transistor like. This is more like a, a, a resistant type. The two have been obtained with two different material, one MOS2 and the other activated carbon. So you can change the, the result and by changing the material that you have. So you are now a tool to create new device, new gates, let's say new uh, object by just using a different material. So basically, man resistor. But what is the interest of man resistor? Well, man resistor we have seen it over the last years is basically the sort of a missing element, circuit element that's been sold for long years because it's basically it allows to store information, to learn, to basically create a sort of a self-learning device that is an equivalent, the equivalent of a of a machine learning, but on the hardware point. A lot has been done so far on um, on. Uh, uh, from a solid state point of view using transistors and so on. But again, the, the memory system that has been, all the memory systems presented and realized so far based on electrons, we're not able to reproduce the best memory system that exists in the world, that is the, the neurons and synapses. So there is no way from an energetical point of view, it's, all of these are very expensive. It's that they are very costly from the point of view of uh, how much energy you have to use. But also there is one problem is that they cannot follow the, the ability of this of the brain to learn and to store information for a long time without being uh, activated all the time. So the hope that we have is that here with our first ionic memory system that is based on the same building block of, the, of our synapse because we are always using ions like uh, the brain, we may have found an object that is able to reproduce what is happening in, in the synapse. So here again, I just remind you what is uh, what is the result. So basically, we have a device with uh, two sides of a conductance. What is G O G of and one is a G on, and this G of and G on depends on the voltage that you apply. So with this device, you can now do, we can now realize the real forceful form of the learning, where basically the state depends on the voltage you apply. So you can write, so you can store information inside. You can read it without destroying it. And then you can cancel it if you change the device. So you have basically another device that you see here is able to change the number of conductors as a function of the number of spikes that you that you that you did. And every state here is basically a state of memory that you modify. So you can store information and so in a in a in a on a kind of conductors change. And this change is stable on time. So it's not something that goes back uh, alone. You you, you have to erase it for real. And this ability to store information very long allows us to compare even more to what is happening, for example, in, the, in a real synapse. So the idea of how to react to when you have, uh, when the synapse is connecting two activated potentials, it's like the case of, uh, of, the, of a synapse between two neurons. And the question is that, is it able to learn and to, to store memory so in a certain way? So, uh, how it function in our brain? So the connection between two neurons is uh, strengthened by the fact that the neurons fight at the same time. So like this, basically you say that if you have two neurons that are uh, activated at the same, more or less at the same time, the synapse in the middle is uh, changing the conductance with a very large change in conductance of the conductance state. So basically, it's strengthened the connection between the two electrons. And then we do we perform the same with our with our device here, as is in solid state. Based on uh, on, uh, on ion transport, and we observe that uh, our uh, our ionic device is able to reproduce quite well the the response of the synapse. So this is essentially way it's the first artificial synapse, and we can use now to use this uh, this device just to 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 look and to go towards ion joints with uh, we can use two nanochannels channels as a let's say ionic resistor that are able to mimic standard response of biological counterparts. And this is a sort of a, a new playground for neuromorphic computer. So we can now hope to integrate 
this new element on a standard uh, semiconductor uh, um, device where exactly where you can have now an object that is able to transfer information, store information, and do sort of non classical uh, calculation. And this is basically what uh, we are we are doing in this moment. So our effort is essentially to move from this first demonstration of ion model resistor to a nanofluidic resistor on a, on a chip. And uh, with this, just to remind okay, that the interest of nanofluidic resistor today is that yes, this from a fundamental point of view, extremely interesting field because it's a field where you are sort of you are the medium between fluid dynamics, statistical physics, hard condensed matter, now even chemistry and animal science. It is a, a, a field where the path between um, fundamental results and innovation is extremely short. For example, as we have seen with our company that is uh, moving our fundamental study in 2013 to a uh, real power plant in 2024. But also is a field now where can offer new Exactly new results, in particular for what we are interested in, is in these things of neuromorphic electronics that we can consider a sort of a new revolution for semiconductor industry. And with this, I can okay, I can conclude here. Thank all the collaborators that we with our team, as myself, the full report and guests, all our students, and our collaborator from us. So thank you very much for your time and here for the question. Thank you, Professor Syria, for this uh, wonderful presentation of, uh, and taking us into the world of nanofluidics. Uh, so, questions? Uh, uh, may I ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Hello. Hello. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I would like to know if I understood correctly what what the mean. It's very new for me the area. So you're, you're letting uh, fluid go through the nanostructure and due to chemical reasons, you have, you extract charge from, from the fluid uh, and the charge becomes statistically accumulated in a weak link in, in this nano, nano region. Is it correct yeah. picture? Yeah, basically, you say exactly, you have, because of chemical okay. reasons, basically like this, you have a surface, static surface charge on the wall. And then yeah. the screens in the water screens. So, and then you work with this uh, elect electrostatic energy for some reason. I, I, the, there are several uh, 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 scales of energies involved in this process. And I would like to ask you one particular question. This electrostatic energy, which associated with the fluctuating charge, yeah. can this... Uh, uh, Coulomb forces, I mean, due to this energy, affect geometry of your device. I mean, deform, mechanically deform your channels and so on, because it must be huge energy because of small size of, of the conductor. So you, you, you might have that your geometry fluctuates with the charge because of these deformations, electrostatic, or I am wrong. You are not wrong at all, actually. So in our case, for the nanotube, it's the nanotube is extremely stiff and doesn't like to change the radius so much. But it looks like you have seen the preliminary results of this colleague, our colleague in Manchester, where they did the same measurement with the with the basically suspended graphene on on a sort mm -hmm. of a large scale, where you are basically uh, it's like, where it's not so stiff. Let's say, and they observe a sort mm -hmm. of. A, a sort of, uh, let's say, bending of this uh, gra the graphene or the sort of uh, mm. change of the height because of this uh, interaction in the, mediated by the fluid, absolutely. Mm. In our case, not. So, mm, mm. Sorry? Well, so in our case, the nanotube is not changing because it's very stiff. The bending to, to, to mm -hmm. change the range of the nanotube is very, is very complicated. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, I am fully satisfied. Uh, I have also a question on the nano uh, membrane, uh, the case which you discussed at the very end. Maybe you can go two sli yeah, slides or whatever back. So, uh, what what do you have in mind when you compare that to uh, uh, to the elements from our brain? 
So what would be the, uh, the spatial scales? Are they comparable uh, or what? Uh, so the scale, for example, the scale of our uh, device is few microns. And two, so in terms of this dimension, the ionic device and the synapse is very much the same. It's, uh, we are smaller in the one sense that we still don't understand how, I mean, the sky, the scale of the synapse is in the order of few tens of nanometer and the length is a few microns, so it's very similar to what we have. We are a bit larger and a bit thinner, but this <coughs> length is the same. And when you compare it, for example, is that here we insert, you, we insert in a sort of way the, 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 our artificial synapse, if you call it like this, or more like a manister, between two simulated neurons. So we, the neuron you can, for, at this point, we just simulated as a sort of a, a, an activation potential. So we say there is, one random spike of voltage on, from, one, from one generator and one random spike from the other. So this is basically how neurons interact between them. And in our brain, two neurons, when you, the two neurons spikes, so let's say, if it is one before the other, the synapse can react in a certain way. So the synapse prefer to, for example, to have A before B or B before A. So if there is A before B, so the, the left neuron spike before the right, the synapse can block the, the connection, but if it is the other way around, we can favorize by strengthening the, the, the connection. So this is basically the top left graph that you see is that if the, the post-synaptic spike arrives, this is in red, the post-synaptic spike arrives before the pre-synaptic spike, you have a decrease of the conduction, so there is no transport information, and the way around on the other side. And this is the case that we observe here is the same. So you basically use the fact that the conductance state depends strongly on the on the history and the, where you apply, and then you can make it like uh, okay, if it is the left or B before A or A before B, you have you, you have information that transport or not, and the scalar is the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, what uh, what can you say about the the uh, microscopic so to say mechanisms uh, if you compare them between your uh, ionic membrane and the and the real <clears throat> uh, uh, neurons and, and uh, synapses in the brain. I have to be honest. I don't. I do not think that it is a, in any way similar to microscopic origin. In our case, it is for real the fact that we create pairs, the pairs of charges in confinement because of this long uh, electrostatic logarithmic electrostatic interaction to D. So we create pairs, but this is true only on very small dimension. I do not believe that exactly at this scale or at the scale of the real synapse, there is perfectly the same, the same phenomena. It may, if we should be able to understand, we should really understand what is the surface charge of, uh, of, the, of the synapse. I don't think it's, again, I don't think that we are talking about the same microscopic origin, but we could use our device, since the response is the same in a certain way to, investigate the energy efficiency of the synapse or also how two neurons can communicate. But I'm not sure that we can use it for real to, to investigate the, fun, the fundamental properties of the synapse. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you. So there is some accumulation of the charge. There are, there, are, there are two things I come here and then we, we observe on this. Exactly. There are two phenomena. The, the, so the accumulation of charges at the entrance is basically the origin of this activated carbon. So activated carbon is a, is a material with a larger surface charge. So it means that there is a, a big imbalance between positive and negative ions inside the channel. So this creates a sort of a, a clouds at the extreme of the two entrance of the channel. So this is a sort of, a, this entrance effect, this accumulation of charge can modify a lot the conductance. And when you apply long, very large surface voltage, in the, for example, uh, yeah, voltage at the between two things, you can clean or you can flush or unflush the discharge. So this is one of it. The other one that is, for example, for MOS2, that is not at all charged and so on, it's more like a C, in a certain way, a beam effect. It's essentially just the beam effect. So you have a couple of pairs of ions, plus and positive and negative, that are 
able to interact inside the channel because of this uh, uh, electrostatic energy. So you have basically two, uh, two a couple of, uh, of, of ions that are strongly interacting. But when you apply a very small surface charge, they are put to sort of very small electrostatic field, they are together. So they do not transport charge. But if you apply a very or a large electric field, if the electric field is strong enough, you can break this, uh, this pair, and then you have two charges that are able to move. And when you remove it, when you remove the surface, this, um, this uh, electric field, you need time before then to, to be able to, to couple again. And that is the, the reason why you have this first. So you have two fields, two different types of metal resistor, and this depends on the material that you're using. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Thank you all. So it's not so. Uh, thank you, Professor Silvia. I just thank our speaker again. And uh, thank you all for joining our today's colloquium. Uh, with this, uh, we conclude. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Oh. It is hot, especially in the last one, right? It is a lot of the when speaking as a professor for the the air of the world.